Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be having our weekly compilation of True Scary Stories. I hope you enjoy them. So without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these True Scary Stories. So there's this one memory from when I was around 12 that still gives me chills when I think about it. It was a family trip to an amusement park. You know, one of those days filled with excitement and anticipation. I was itching to try out this roller coaster. The kind that's short, but crazy fast. Anyway, I'm waiting in line with my family and there's this kid in front of me, about 10 years old with his mom. The coaster we're about to get on has three layers stacked on top of each other, and it loops around three times before it ends. It's a pretty intense ride to say the least. So we're on the coaster picking up speed, wind whipping through our hair, and suddenly I notice the kid in front of me leaning out beyond the safety of the ride. My heart just about stops, because I see these thick support beams coming up fast. And then it happens. The kid's head narrowly misses getting scraped by one of those beams. I mean, it was so close that I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The kid's okay, thankfully. But man, it was a terrifying moment. Looking back, I realized that my memory may have exaggerated things a bit. But the fear that I felt in that moment was real. It's definitely made me more cautious on thrill rides ever since. So this is technically a near-death slash death experience, I guess. A hospital that I used to work at used mechanical compressors. So instead of people doing chest compressions, we would strap this machine on and let it do the work. It was actually pretty effective. Got the call to a code. Patient was out. Strap the machine on. Patient wakes up and starts yelling at us to stop. It hurts. Turn the machine off. Patient goes down again. Turn the machine on. Patient wakes up. We did this for what felt like forever. The patient by the end was crying and asking what was happening every time we started the machine. In the end, we were not able to save the patient. It still stands out as one of the most traumatic things that I've seen or done in my 20 plus years of working in the medical field. And that includes working in big city trauma centers. We coded a roughly 50 year old lady in the ER for like 10 or 15 rounds once that was showing pulseless electrical activity, PEA a rhythm where the heart is circulating almost no blood and essentially flatlining. On the monitor and the doctor running the code was about to call it. The people switching off on compressions were already starting to drip with sweat and some were looking at him like, you gonna call it or what? After one nurse spoke up, he ordered one more round of EPI and chest compressions and encouraged us to keep going probably already the longest code I had seen a doctor do without any reassuring results. Sure enough, she goes back into a normal sinus rhythm after this last round, and we stabilize and ship her to the ICU. Five days later, she comes back through the ER to thank us, speaking in clear, coherent sentences. I've never been much more shocked by a patient experience than to see this woman wheel back through the ER looking like she had a minor bad day. Not only did I expect her to make it out of the code, but I also didn't expect her to make it out of the ICU, as not many discharge. And when she did, 
I sure didn't expect her to have the energy to come back and visit us, to expect gratitude with no speech deficits, or difficulty forming cohesive thoughts. This particular doctor was usually quick to call codes that seemed to be going nowhere, so I'm not sure what made him do things differently this day. But he must have seen something that none of us did, and I'm glad that he did. I haven't talked to him in years, but maybe I'll reach out to him and ask now that I'm talking about it. Edit. I texted him and asked what made him run that code so many times, and he just simply said, you just go off of your gut. I'm not a doctor, but I am a lawyer, a former public defender. I had a client charged with assault with a deadly weapon. The guy my client shot went to the hospital and coded out in the ambulance. The ER doctor testifying at trial said a cop had accompanied the victim and EMS to the hospital. The doctor apparently went up to the cop and told him since they had several medical students observing at the hospital, they were going to rotate them in and do another round of CPR for the experience. While the med students were doing the CPR, the guy quote unquote came back to life and tried to get up from the ER table. I'm the opposite here, but a nurse later told me that the look that I had on my face during this interaction was unlike anything he'd ever seen. I'm going to be vague about the specifics, but I had a fairly serious emergency operation that required me to be put firmly under for a good amount of time. Everything was happening very quickly around me, and the last thing that I remember is them wheeling me into the OR and telling me to count down from 10. I didn't make it to one, as you'd expect. While under, I had a life-changing NDE that to this day I have feelings about. But that's not really the point. During it, I actually concluded that I had died and was comfortable in going on to whatever happens next. As the whole point of the near-death experience was to prepare me for the transition from life to life in a way that I'd specifically understand and be convinced by. Before I had the chance to transition in the way the near-death experience told me I would, I was jolted out of the experience in a way that I can only describe as what I imagine a big electronic device might feel, if it could, when being turned on after having its power off. I was like, shocked back into reality, unexpectedly, and the pain was overwhelming. For a good one to two minutes, I couldn't move any of my limbs or speak, and I was just drooling on myself in a semi-upright position on the slab. As I gained some mobility, I could see that the operation had already been completed, as the repairs, if you will, were done, and in the state they'd end up in. The nurse came over to me and asked if I was ready to start the operation, which absolutely floored me. I was looking at the end result and felt like my consciousness had desynced with time. Apparently, I just mumbled, Start the operation? It's already done. Before blacking out and waking up a day later, the nurse said that he'd never seen anyone have the look that I had in that exchange. I attempted to unalive myself a few years ago by hanging myself with an extension cord. I had no pulse when the police arrived, but nobody is really sure how long I was up there. I was resuscitated in the ambulance, but was in a coma for a little under two weeks. Anyway, all I remember is a feeling similar to general anesthesia 
once I jumped off the table. But for the five seconds before it went black, I was in total panic and had a total change of heart from the confidence in my decision to end it seconds before. And then, it was just nothing. Like a deep sleep. And when I finally awoke from the coma, it was like finally reaching the surface of the pool after diving too deep. I was in the same panic that I was immediately after I jumped from my table. Like I just blinked instead of being knocked out for two weeks. So to answer your question, I don't remember anything at all. It was like being in a deep, dreamless sleep. Perhaps if I had regained consciousness immediately after being resuscitated, I'd remember something more interesting. But yeah, nothing is about all that I can offer. When I was eight, I learned how to fix small engines. That being said, my dad had an old flathead Briggs & Stratton 5.5 horsepower engine that didn't work. He also had a riding lawnmower that had no engine nor blades. He gave me the task of getting the engine running. I could put it on the riding lawnmower and have fun whenever. I was so anxious at school the next day. Well, that day I tore apart the motor and had it running by bedtime. The next day, we had the thing mounted and riding around. Flash forward a few weeks. Me and my older sister were out riding when my shoelace got caught on the back spindle. It pulled me off and was dragging me. Mind you, only going as fast as it would go. My sister stopped and went in reverse, which caused her to go right onto me. The chain and chain wheel caught my lower right back, ripping my skin open and pulling my large and small intestine out, severing my right lung, breaking my spine in two places, and shredding my right kidney. I felt the thing roll onto me and then everything went blank. Couldn't see. Couldn't move. Couldn't speak. Nothing. No pain either. All I remember was the blackness. After my father got my heart beating again, I remember lying there in pain. Also remember feeling my back and short of breath. I felt what I still believe as my stomach in my hand while I was feeling my back. Once I was in the ambulance, everything went blank. Except this time I saw myself laying there and the medic shocking me. I felt a hard pull and was back in myself. A few minutes later, I was on a table with strangers in white all around me. I remember them in a panic, then standing next to my grandmother who passed when I was three. She told me she was my Nana. We were there watching them jolt my heart with tiny round paddles. She kept telling me it was okay. They called my death time at 6.06 p.m. Then all of a sudden I wake up and I'm all fixed and stapled up. My parents told me that I had died three times. The first for five minutes. The second was a little more than 12 minutes. But the last time was astonishing to the doctors. My heart stopped beating for 20 minutes. My parents made them continue jolting my heart. They told me that the doctor kept telling them that I was going to have a 98% chance of being brain dead. I'm 25 years old now, and I'm healthy as ever. I'm fully capable of walking as well. Thank you for reading. I was stabbed in the stomach with a fillet knife by my schizophrenic uncle when I was 15 years old. I remember freaking out, lying on the floor hyperventilating while I was bleeding out. I had tried to crawl up from my basement to phone 911, but I was so weak. 
and every time I moved, I started bleeding harder. I remember passing out and having the sensation like I was leaving a dark room and moving outside into the sun. I stopped panicking, and this feeling of pure contentment settled over me. I was floating over a garden where all of the plants were giving off light, and I could see a huge amorphous shape above me that was made up of every color in existence, including colors I have never seen before and couldn't possibly describe. The shape seemed familiar, like I was a part of it, and it was beckoning to me and filling me with pure ecstasy and understanding as I looked at it. Then a man who looked like an awful lot like Dream from the Sandman comics, which I was obsessed with at the time, walked over to me through the garden and told me that I couldn't go home yet, that it wasn't time. I started weeping, but I was filled with a feeling of understanding, like I knew that I had to go back, despite not wanting to. The man had tears streaming down his face, and he took my hand and led me back to my body, which was in an ambulance. My older brother had found me and called 911. Four years later, I experienced a kind of weak flashback slash replay of the feeling that I had while looking at the giant shape in the sky while I was on psilocybin mushrooms. It felt like I was intimately connected to every aspect of the universe and that all things that could be known were understood intuitively in that state, like an all-encompassing answer to some divine question. But I couldn't put it into words or symbols of any sort. It was all so obvious in that moment. I felt omniscient and omnipresent, but it was a shadow of the feeling I had during my near-death experience. I didn't have any religion in my upbringing, and I've never been inclined to believe in any sort of organized spirituality. But those two experiences were so vivid and otherworldly that they have convinced me that there are dimensions to existence that are beyond our current ability to grasp in a tangible, scientific way. It felt like I had pressed my face up against some sort of veil and looked through a pinhole at something beyond imagining. People have told me that it was all just the simple product of brain chemistry and that there is nothing spooky about my experience, but I honestly have trouble taking them seriously because none of them had actually experienced anything like it. I challenge anyone to have an experience like this and not come away highly skeptical about our current scientific worldview. There seems to be this undercurrent of feeling among some that we are rapidly approaching a comprehensive and objective view of reality, that science is in its twilight years, and that we are just tying up some loose ends. But my experience has led me to believe that the cosmos is much more mysterious than anyone but the most original thinkers are giving it credit for. Thank you for listening. Growing up, my father used to tell me of an experience that he had while having open heart surgery. The doctors had to stop his heart for about 20 or 30 minutes while they inserted a mechanical valve into his heart. At the time, he was in his early 20s and was involved in a lot of bad activity that he says he is ashamed of now. Anyway, while my dad was dead, he said that he was in a very dark place and as he wandered around, he started running into very scary people who were deformed and screaming at him. He ran for his entire life into a corner and hid. And just before the people got to him, he looked up and saw his deceased grandmother reach her hand down and grab him. The next thing my dad remembered, he was back in the hospital. He's convinced that he was temporarily in hell. I don't know if this was just a dream state or something, but I've never seen my dad so convinced in his life. It was enough for him to turn his life around and turn to religion and more importantly, come back to his family 
that he had left behind. I saw a field with trees on both sides. I could see water. I felt like there was an ocean on one side of the path. If you can imagine the fields that electrical lines go through, where there are no residents and they just clear out the area for the power lines, it was like that. There was a tree in the middle and a well-worn path around it. I was walking that path. It looked like an oak tree. It was very large, and presents came to walk with me. I told it that I was ill, and that this seemed like a nice place. The entity, I'm non-religious so I don't know what it was, told me that I was not done and that I should return, that I would be happy one day. It was so peaceful, beautiful, but the foremost seemed dark and scary. The trees on both sides seemed a place that I did not want to go. I only wanted to go towards the water. Then I saw a bright light and I woke up in the ICU. I hope this doesn't turn into some kind of religious debate or some kind of medical versus spirituality thing. This was just my experience. Take it as that. My sister was shot while she was walking her dogs in our small town in Alaska. The bullet ricocheted around piercing her bowels in nine places. Even though we had one of the best Rhodes Scholar docks in the north at our ER, and the only flight out of town was miraculously minutes away from takeoff and held up to fly her to Anchorage, she bled out and died on the operating room table. She knows because she vividly remembers everything that the surgeon said as she lied dead on the table. What she told me later is remarkable. She recalls drifting up and into a very bright light. She was no longer in pain and felt compelled to travel into the brilliance. It led to an amazing river. Seriously, the look on her face when she describes this place helps me realize that radiant, endless joy is not just a possibility, but an eventuality. She describes playing in a river that consisted of pure knowledge. Anything she ever wanted to know was at her fingertips. As she played in this amazing river, she could sense figures on the distant shore. They were our people, she explained. Our family. Our animals all waiting patiently for her to finish playing in the river and wade towards them on the shore. Though she was not ready to leave the marvelous river, she knew without being told that they would wait patiently and joyfully. But she never made it to the shore. As she was playing, an amazing thing happened. Seriously, people, if you could look and see the look on her face when she describes this next part, you would laugh for pure joy. A being approached her. She did not know what it was, except to describe it as pure, unconditional, ebullient love. It radiated love. It pulsed love. And all things diminished before the radiance of that love. The next part makes me chuckle a bit, even though that seems out of place. She said it spoke to her and said that she had to go back that it wasn't her time. She said like a little kid, but I don't want to. When she recounts this experience, she emphasizes that to be in proximity of that being is all there is. She describes it as a completion, a peace, a welcoming. To leave was incomprehensible, but to decline was also incomprehensible. She felt infused with a purpose. Very, 
very reluctantly she returned to life. She is amazing. They patched her femoral artery and explained that the graft would eventually give. In all probability, she will die within minutes. Living with that sword of Damocles should be terrifying. No, to her it's a promise that she will get to return. Life is what we're here to do, she explains. But after is sweet, benevolent, all-encompassing love. With every single breath, my sister is heartbeats from death, and I have never met anyone who is more alive and fearless. A man came and spoke to one of my classes this semester about his near-death experience, and it gave me great comfort, so I wanted to share it here. He was kayaking with a friend, and ended up flipping his and being sucked under by the current. He was sucked into a pipe under the water and struggled to get out, almost made it and was sucked back in. He passed out, and his friend saw his lifeless body being tossed down the river. This is how he described his experience in the moments that he was unconscious. He was in a dark place, almost like a cave, only the walls were soft and velvety. At the end of this cave was a beautiful kaleidoscope of colors. He made it sound similar to a stained glass window, and on the other side of this colored glass dark figures were passing by. He said that all sense of time was lost and it felt like his wife and kids would come join him at any minute. He said it was the most comforting and peaceful feeling he has ever experienced. He said that he had the strong sense that God wanted him and everyone there so badly, and that you must have to do something pretty terrible to go to hell, because he wasn't the greatest of guys before this. His friend was able to catch up to his body and revive him, and he said now he feels a stronger connection with everyone and is grateful to have had this experience. I hope this was calming to some of you like it was to me. Some of the posts on here are pretty scary. Many others on this thread have voiced similar occurrences, and from my studies in transcendental psychology, near-death experiences and the like, it is documented that there are commonalities that are documented from such experiences, so there is a lot of truth to be taken from these accounts. The following is my own. Just before my 18th birthday, during the summer after graduating high school, I was tearing around on a three-wheeler with friends. This old trike was not cared for by the owners, but I didn't know that, so I was doing my best to whiz around just as fast as the newer quads I was riding with. I broke off from the group and ended up hitting a slight bump and forcing the pins holding the front axle to the frame to shear in two, thus rendering the trike into two entirely separate pieces. The image in your mind may now be me with my butt falling behind on the main portion of the trike whilst my front, still grasping to the handlebars in disbelief, is falling forward, causing a rift in my seating position. The handlebars bounced up and struck just below my voice box, effectively internally severing my trachea. I fell to the ground and was promptly run over by the back half of the trike, which broke my leg and ended up being the boring part of the story. In shock, I stood and tried to call for help, but as those of you paying attention may have surmised, I was unable to force air past my voice box due to the crushed and severed windpipe, and I eventually fell over into a more or less fetal position. When they found me and gathered around while waiting for the paramedics to arrive, it was a 15-minute chopper flight, I accepted my fate. I was about to die. I told those friends and family around me that I loved them 
and my time had come, and I told them goodbye. Once paramedics arrived, I described to them that my collarbone had broken and went through my windpipe and out the back of my neck, even though there was no external injury. They, being paramedics, did what they were trained to do and got me on a stretcher and used a BVM in an attempt to get oxygenated air into my body. This failed as they did not have any inkling that the air had no guidance system and simply filled up my body cavity. Eventually, I was on a helicopter when I passed out. From here, there are two stories to tell. The one that I experienced and the one that occurred through others' experiences. I'm going to tell my own first. I died. As I was fading, I had the realization that death was imminent and thought, aren't I supposed to see a tunnel and light and all that nonsense? Then it happened. I saw the tunnel and light. Only after I made the realization of what was occurring and connected it to our culturally normative thoughts behind what happens at the time of death did I see that tunnel. This has led me to recognize how ingrained cultural beliefs are and how far they can be from reality. Memory fades, but this has lasted vividly for many years since its occurrence. As has mentioned, the feeling of complete oneness with all of existence was my main perception. That the self is not me or I, but rather one as many or all as one. There is actually a Family Guy sketch where they're stuck in purgatory that gives a decent visual example, and it is simply white nothingness. Except not nothingness, but simply an all-encompassing light. That was it for me. There was no concept of time or space, just existence along with the whole of everything, including the number 42. What happened in the world was this. The chopper took me towards a large urban medical center, a 45 minute flight. But when the technicians realized that I wouldn't make it that far, they turned around and went to the small local hospital. There, a team of surgeons couldn't figure out what was wrong. So one bright young lad went and decided in order to save my life, which was quickly drifting away. At this point, my blood oxygen count was well below normal and brain death was a real possibility. Decided to slice open my chest and figure it out. There, they found a mess of a torn trachea and did a quick fix by sticking a tube in and shipping me off to a different medical center where I spent the next six hours in intensive surgery with a team of doctors who were prepared to break my chest and ribs to get at my collapsed trach, which would inevitably recoil behind my heart as the trachea is like a stretched spring inside your chest. Drainage tubes for my lungs were installed, which I still proudly show as scars. And they were a host of balloons to keep my lungs and trachea from collapsing. I spent a week in a coma, and another so doped up that I saw golden retrievers dancing with purple hippos in the ICU. It was an exciting and terrifying hospital stay for the next 30 days since my family was told that I died, would be brain damaged, maybe a vegetable, etc., while I was asleep. You can understand that they were, and still are, some strong feelings regarding the incident. However, when I was told that I would need a tube in my neck to breathe for the rest of my life, and therefore would not be able to swim again, I promptly said screw that, and made up my mind to recuperate. Although I was still high enough to wonder why I couldn't just swim backstroke and keep the tube out of the water. Within 12 months, I was competing in college nationals. And now I race Ironmans, always showing off my scars. This is the full story of how I remember my death experience. I played nose tackle on the football team when I was in high school. During one full speed scrimmage between first string offense and defense, I got caught on a draw play to the left of the center from my perspective. At the time, 
A middle linebacker followed me into the weakness I thought I found in the offensive line. This meant that there was my 200 pounds sprinting forward into an oncoming 180 pound running back with a 170 pound linebacker pushing forward behind me. The running back had gotten much lower than I had and put his face mask straight into my sternum. The combined force of the three of us on my chest led to a blunt force trauma of my heart. I immediately had chest pains, but thought I just had the wind knocked out of me. As I stumbled off the field, the head coach yelled at me to get back onto the field. I tried to respond but couldn't find the air to speak. I tried to remove my helmet, but couldn't find the strength to pry the snaps apart. I made it about five feet off of the field and collapsed. I laid there on my back for a few seconds before I remember my friends yelling for the trainer. I still couldn't breathe, and my chest felt like I was having an asthma attack from hell. A few moments later, a junior college-aged kid, the trainer, appeared over me. He took off my helmet and proceeded to ask me a ton of questions. I could barely speak my responses and then, maybe only a word at a time. This may seem odd, but I remember the coach called for a water break during the trainer's line of questioning. From several yards away, well too far to gauge the situation on his own, the coach asked the trainer how I was doing. The trainer said I was fine and just hyperventilating from an acute asthma attack. He asked his assistant to get my inhaler from his office. I laid there on my back with a chest pain that felt like an elephant was sitting on me at the same time as a knife was cutting me in half. Life seemed to slow down, and everything felt like an eternity. The trainer's assistant returned with my inhaler, and they did their best to give me two pumps. I didn't respond to the medicine like the trainer thought I would, and he froze there kneeling over me. He kept repeating something to himself, but I couldn't hear it. My hearing was fading in and out, and I was only catching bits and pieces. The trainer and his assistant removed my shoulder pads and jersey. Maybe that would help me breathe better. Time seemed to slow down even more, and I felt like I was gulping for air. I had lost all sense of relativity. I don't remember what triggered it, but the trainer called my mom to ask her what she wanted him to do. After he relayed the situation to my mom, she asked him why he was calling her and why he hadn't called 911. I vaguely remember the panicked look on the trainer's face as he sort of asked and told the coach that he was calling 911. An eternity passed. The sky was blue. Forever came and went. I couldn't move. More blue sky, it got lonely. I couldn't see anyone anymore. Just sky. No sound, no air. I tried talking, but all that would come out was nonsense. Suddenly, there were paramedics. This is where my memory starts to get really spotty. I'm in an ambulance. It's not moving. Now the ambulance is moving. What's happening? Why am I in an ambulance? The paramedic is talking to me, but I can't hear him. He's moving so fast. He looks nervous. The inside of the ambulance is shaking. Suddenly, whiteness. Where am I? So white and bright. Then dark. Then white and blurry. Then dark. There's a doctor looking guy and he's with my mom. They're talking. She's crying. Where am I? I'm in a bed. Is this a dentist's office? Why am I at the dentist? Wait, this is a hospital. Why am I at a hospital? Where was I last? I was, I was whiteness. I was in the whiteness, but where was that? The blue sky. I was looking at the blue sky, but where was that? Why am I here? I'm confused. A nurse came in. She told me to relax and try to remain calm. She was taking blood from an IV port on my wrist. When did I, the guy with the fear of needles, get an IV port? Time goes by, but I have no idea how much. Then another nurse comes in. Maybe it's not a nurse, but some sort of hospital assistant. They're moving me to a room because I'm going to have to stay a while. I'm still so out of it, and everything feels surreal. I fall asleep. 
when I wake up in my room, my mom is there. She's a nurse at this Kaiser hospital, and she tells me what I missed. I had a type of heart injury that is very rare. Several tests and images were done, and the doctor wants to talk to me about it. I have no recollection of the imaging events. The doctor comes in while my mom is in the room with me. He explains that the type of heart injury that I sustained is similar to injuries that were seen in random automobile accidents from the mid-1900s. Basically, my heart sustained an injurious impact right around the moment it was in the valley portion of its beat. If I remember correctly, this is the point when the heart is resting and most vulnerable. The injury caused my heart to slow down and stop. I was dead for about two minutes, in the ambulance and the ER. The whole time span from when I was injured until I woke up in the hospital room with my mom was about 15 hours. I spent just over a week in the hospital afterward. This was in 1996. I've since learned that this type of injury was rare, but more common before seatbelts had airbags, were regularly used in cars. My aunt had an experience like this when she was 18. She always suffered of chronic seizures that made her pass out. One day she had one while no one was around. She was later found by my grandmother. The doctors luckily arrived in time to resuscitate her. She explained that she was in the brightest, most peaceful hallway. She wandered aimlessly through it until she found a massive door closed on one end. She told my grandmother that she tried as hard as she could to open the door. Tapping, slamming, even kicking it would not allow the doors to break free. She looked back to see the back of the corridor gone, replaced with an emergency room. She was lying on a stretcher while multiple nurses and doctors were frantically working to revive her. She gave up on the door, turned around and led for the surgery room. She inevitably reached the room and re-entered her body. She passed away at the age of 42 about nine months ago. Heart failure after multiple seizures. She left behind two young daughters and a husband. We like to think that the doors finally opened for her. I don't mention it too often, although I did mention it once when a question like this was asked. At first it's nothing, no sound, no wind, no light, no weight. It's like the weight of the world just disappears and you're in the deep end of the pool just floating there. No matter how far you reach out, you can't grab anything. It isn't cold, it isn't hot, it isn't painful. It was absolute nothing, and it felt like I was there for a long time. After a while, there's a flash of light all around me. I felt a small tingle shoot down my body, and I don't know what happened, but I start falling. Like I suddenly just fell from some place up high. It's like when the school bully comes out of nowhere and just shoves you to the ground, or you trust fall onto someone and they don't catch you. It was a long fall. The light faded, and I was back into the deep end of the pool. After a while longer, I started to see images of myself. I heard nothing, and I only saw me. I don't remember what it was that I did, but it was something important. There's another flash and I can hear voices. Then it fades away again. I don't know exactly what happened, but I woke up in the hospital with my family next to me. The ambulance staff said that I suddenly woke up after they revived me and walked into the ambulance truck and went to sleep. The first thing I could say was that my Nana is proud of our family. I was 13 when this happened. Hit by a bus. Killed on impact. I was dead for six minutes. They almost gave up on me. What was six minutes in real time felt longer for me. The weird thing is that I liked it. 
I felt at peace. There was nothing holding me back and no violence. It was just me, and I liked it that way. I passed out in my father's arms, and I was still able to hear things. I heard everything while being carried through A&E to the resuscitation ward. I could feel and hear everything but not move, and it was really scary. I felt all the tubes and things being poked into my body, and lots of beeping equipment and stuff. It sounded like about five to ten doctors were around shouting and trying to save me. They started talking about all my stats dropping, and I heard them telling my parents that I was probably going to die. The heart rate monitor turned to a constant beep, and I heard my mother screaming and squeezing my hand and shaking me. I was still in my passed out state, hearing and feeling but not being able to move or talk for about three seconds until the two senses I did have disappeared, and I was in complete darkness for a short while, just with my thoughts. After that short while, I began to hear a kind of blinky noise, a bit like a xylophone. Then lots of little colored lights appeared that were blinking on and off very slowly. It was like I was floating around space, and they were little blinking planets. There was one big white planet that was not blinking, and I felt like I was moving through the other planets towards it. At this point, I had realized I was dead and was just thinking about my life, my family, and the people that I love. It was really peaceful. I was like that for what felt like hours until I began to hear my mom and dad again crying and the doctors telling them that I was coming back. Then the easiest way to explain how I got back to my body would be after you die on Battlefield 3 and you're in the menu choosing a class then you suddenly get resuscitated by someone else. That is pretty much exactly what it felt like. I was in my body for a short while in the passed out state again, hearing and feeling but no sight or movement, until I opened my eyes and saw my parents next to my bed. Then I started to laugh and would have sat up to hug them, but I couldn't move because of all the things that I was plugged into. I ended up staying in the hospital for a week and a bit, and missed a few GCSE exams. Prologue. Turns out I have very acute asthma and had been on a long bike ride the night before with my lonesome. I had a bit of a chesty cough and didn't get any sleep that night due to much trouble breathing. I had just assumed that I had a chest infection. Not once did I associate it with asthma. My dad made me stay home from school that day but he had to go to work so I was by myself. I was having serious difficulty breathing and could not move to ring my mom. She ended up coming to see me, finding me in my bed unable to move. She immediately took me to the doctor's surgery, who said it was just a chest infection and gave me some antibiotics and said that it would fix itself. I went back home, still having a lot of difficulty breathing and stayed there for a short while. My dad came home from work early for other reasons and found me suffocating on the floor. He immediately took me to the nearest hospital, and as he parked the car, my breathing was cut off entirely, which was the scariest moment of my entire life. I started to hit my dad because now I was truly suffocating. He ditched the car out of the front of the hospital and carried me in his arms. I passed out while he was running through reception. I now have three actuators, hardcore inhalers, an anti-inflammatory for my throat and nose, and check up with the doctors every few weeks. My dad also feels extremely bad for leaving me that morning because he did not realize that it was so serious. This will probably get buried, but I was gone for a few minutes 
and the going out was strangely similar to an Alex Gray painting. All of the things I had seen, like faces and landscapes, converged on themselves, creating tinier reflections of each other in endless waves, until they were so fragmented that everything went black. It was the most peaceful feeling in the world, or out of it, and I was disintegrated into nothing and everything. I don't know what or who gave me the signal, but at some point I was notified that if I didn't start breathing I would stay there. The scary part is that I wanted to. I had never known such satisfaction and oneness, but the love of someone on the other side made me take that first breath. Coming back wasn't the same. It was just all at once. I was just there, confused and hollow feeling. I remember it rained and I cried. It was hard to adjust in my mind because I had never wanted to die before. But being there was so different than what I had thought it would be like. It's true, it was a blackness. But not because it was empty. It was black because there was so much detail and complexity that it was simple. It feels weird to describe now because I have since found a love in being a part of one thread in the blanket again. But I wanted to share because I always thought that it was odd that I remembered. My mom died on April Fool's Day in 1997. She was pronounced dead on arrival at the hospital due to internal bleeding. She said the last thing she remembered before the death dream was the piercing blue collar of the paramedic's eyes. Then the dream came. She was on a golf course, and everyone she had ever met in her life was standing on the hills looking at her. There was a massive storm, and she held onto the nearest tree as her body was being shredded by this horrible, vicious storm. She said eventually the storm stopped. She collapsed in a heap on the ground and the sun came out, and then she came out of her coma. She was dead for a matter of minutes, and in a coma for ten days. I was drowning. My high school friends and I got some inner tubes, some screwdrivers, and a bunch of rope and went rafting down a local river. We tied our inner tubes together so we wouldn't drift apart. After a couple minutes, it became clear that my tube, which was an inflatable crocodile pool toy, was leaking. But the river was pretty gentle, so we kept going. It stayed gentle until we got to the bridge. We didn't manage to get untangled in time and our flotilla crashed right into a pillar. My inflatable crocodile and I were in the front. I hit it full force, then was pushed down when the rest of our fleet came crashing in. I went down. The river had been gentle, but there were currents around the pillars, and I couldn't get back up. My crocodile shot up and away from me. I was sucked down and it was very dark. I tried to use the pillar to reorient myself, but the water was pulling hard, this is when things get fuzzy. A friend reached down to try and save me. I nearly dragged her down. Everything was flailing and panic and dark. And then there was just the dark. And peace. I remember the calm. I felt like I was in the belly of the sea. That I'd sunk under the world and somewhere better. It was like coming home after a long day. Then there was a painful burst of light that felt like it tore me inside out. I exploded out of the water and through the air, but at the time it was just pain and cold, then the slap of hitting the water again. And then I wasn't drowning anymore. I was in shallow waters, which was good. I felt like the world was unfamiliar, and like I hadn't seen this place or those people in years. My friends told me later that I'd popped out of the water, like a cork, and went sprawling through the air. I ended up well downstream from them which seems odd. Perhaps I let myself drift and don't remember. The next day was our last day of high school. A couple days later, our graduation. After that, I didn't see any of those friends again. But somewhere, in an old friend's scrapbook is an apology for me, for almost drowning her. In mine, there's a hand drawn in memoriam for my deceased crocodile.
I was hiking along one of the outlier Appalachian trails. I was alone. I always hike with a pistol. I followed a game trail for a spell to climb high in a ridge in hopes to get some pictures from a vantage point when I heard a low, guttural growl from a thicket. I'm familiar with most animal sounds from this area. I don't know what it was, and I've not heard it since. I stopped and peered into the thicket, but couldn't see anything obvious. I drew my weapon and backed out of the trail for about a hundred yards, and walked the rest of the trail back to the main hiking trail. I continued on until I came across a man and woman walking with a dog. The dog was fairly aggressive, and evidently gave them fits holding him, so we didn't chat. I moved on another hundred yards and stopped for lunch. I wish I had time to inform them that I heard something, but figured that they wouldn't travel the game trail. As I was eating my lunch, I heard the dog go ballistic in the distance. I quickly grabbed my things and walked back towards the game trail that I followed earlier. I never saw those people again. I checked the papers and researched, but no one was ever reported missing from that area. To this day, I never found out what was growling in the thicket. Earl Schaefer, the first man to complete the entire Appalachian Trail. He was doing it for the second time, I think. I was walking the trail by myself, and out of the woods comes an old, disheveled dude. I was like, oh great, I'm dead. We exchanged hellos and continued on our separate ways. A few hours later, some hikers passed by me and asked if I had seen some old dude wearing blah 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 and I said yes. They asked if I knew who he was, and I said no. They said it was Earl Schaefer hiking the entire trail for the second time. This isn't as crazy as some of the others on here, but my friend had an encounter when we were hiking a 50 mile section of the Appalachian Trail in upstate New York. I was a boy scout at the time, so I must have been about 15 or 16, and was with at least a dozen other people. I was up at the front of the group with my friend Tyler, and the trail was approaching a cliffside. All of a sudden, I hear loud rustling in the leaves, a scream from Tyler, and then a loud hissing noise that quickly faded to nothing. Tyler had stepped on what he later described to be a copperhead and immediately reacted by getting his foot underneath it and punting it off the cliff. I was told this story over this past summer by someone that I met running a campground up by the Yellowstone slash Tetons area. It was a privately owned campground located in the greater Yellowstone region. Anyhow, I checked in, met the dude running the spot. He was really laid back and down to earth, and even gave me updated accommodations, glamping instead of my campsite for free. Anyhow, we connected pretty well. I felt comfortable around him and safe at his spot, which is important as I travel solo mostly. As we started chatting one morning and he was telling me how he spent some time two to three months ago on the Appalachian Trail, starting in Georgia and moving up north. I don't remember how it was brought up, but he begins telling me how one day he found a cut off the trail, an old carriage road or something, and that it was pretty quiet. Not many Appalachian trail hikers go off into this portion. Anyhow, he starts telling me how one day he's hiking and begins hearing branches and twigs breaking off the trail on his side. Being the only one there, he suspects it's an animal. According to him, he sets up camp that night and begins hearing the same noises around his campsite. Well, he begins to get sketched out and decides that he'll rest quickly and gets back on the trail. Morning comes and he hits the trail again, 
and begins hearing the same noises. He begins telling me how he starts to get a little sketched out at this point. He seemed pretty legit, getting emotional and whatnot. Not overly dramatic, but you could tell that he was affected by recalling this. The dude tells me that he starts picking up his pace on the trail, and the noises begin to keep pace with him. Finally, he reached a ranger station, which was closed. He says that he was so freaked out that he was ready to break in when a ranger pulls up and sees him distraught. He starts explaining what is going on, and supposedly the ranger tells him that he's surprised he made it that far by himself and lets him in the station. He gets inside, and the ranger shows him a storage area with around a dozen packs that he claimed to have picked up, with nobody around. Now the story gets weird, and I feel that the guy is full of crap, but again, he seems pretty emotional. He claims that while the station, him and the ranger hear something on the roof, and he starts mimicking the sounds that this creature was making. Pretty much just really strange and obnoxious creature noises. He claims that it was Mothman or an alien. I have no clue what this dude was recalling, or if he was full of crap. However, it sent me on a quest to see if anyone else has had a similar experience on this portion of the Appalachian Trail. Let me start this by saying that I have lived in the Appalachian Mountains all my life and have experienced a lot of strange things. My family was Irish and settled in West Virginia, but I currently live in the North Carolina portion of these wonderful mountains. That being said, I have learned a lot about what really lurks in these woods, but this was nothing like I had ever experienced before. It all began with my golden retriever Ozzy growling like I had never heard before. He literally never growls, so that had me really uncomfortable, but this growl was bone chilling. It was like he was getting ready to have a fight for his life or something. I took both him and my other dog out at around 11 p.m., and he would not leave my side. I noticed that my workshop door was open, so I walked down to close and lock it up. The entire time, he is glued to my side. Ozzy also kept trying to get in between my legs, still growling, and all of his hair sticking straight up like a feral animal. The second that I closed the door, all hell breaks loose in the woods. It sounded like 50 full-grown men had broken out into a full sprint tearing through the woods. Trees were shaking and branches were falling. In all of my life, I have never been that scared. We got back in the house before I crapped my pants, and I got my pistol slash mag light to figure out what the heck was going on out there. When the dog and I got back outside, we were surrounded by what sounded like people mumbling. It was everywhere. I shined the light all over the woods and couldn't see anything, but the sound was coming from all around. It sounded as if you got a full gem of people to baby mumble. You could almost make out words. That's why I don't think it was an animal. I almost immediately felt sick like I was having a mix between a panic attack and the full swing of the flu. Back inside the house, it sounded like people were walking around all night. The windows were creaking, and you could clearly hear the sound of shoes on gravel. The mumbling never stopped. Every time I got up to check the house, my feet would touch the floor and it would get dead silent. You couldn't hear birds, crickets, frogs, or anything. I was terrified and didn't sleep a wink. The air felt thick and evil all night. And that's the only way that I can explain this feeling. Imagine a soaking wet quilt being tossed over you. That's how I felt. I'm looking for any answers as to what this could be. This wasn't like the normal spooky stories that my grandma and great uncles used to tell me. I feel like this scene traumatized me, 
since I remember it so well whenever I think about fear. The reason this memory scares me till this day is probably because I have yet to discover what animal it was. My closest bet would probably be raccoons, but the uncertainty is what frightens me so much. That day, I decided to push a bit more, and even though I was at a shelter with my trail fam and it was dusk, I just wanted to keep moving and night hike to the closest camping spot ahead. We've been there before. I waited out the momentary rain in the shelter and started hiking moments before it actually got dark. My buddy told me not to drink the water from one of the water sources ahead because apparently there was a factory accident or something contaminated the stream or river. I remember going downhill from that shelter, crossing the stream, and then having to cross a highway that was pretty wide. It had a thickly wooded median strip. At this point, I was ready to pitch my tent anywhere, but the surroundings didn't permit that, so I kept going. I got into a woody section of the trail where everything around my headlamp was pitch dark. The headlamp, by the way, had an issue, most likely because of weak battery. It would dim itself and I would have to reset it. It was enough to see where my next step was going, so I just kept it dim. This is when I encounter a pair of eyes reflecting back at me from the right. Nothing out of the ordinary when night hiking. Could be anything, really. The eyes were medium size, roughly four to five inches apart and four foot off the ground. Right next to them were another pair of eyes, but slightly smaller and shorter. My first thought was actually bear cubs. Because of the way that they acted, it really reminded me of curious cubs mesmerized behind their mama. I just let them be and focused on moving forward. And this is when I saw it. One, two, three more of them, all slightly varying in size, and this time on my left. I grabbed my trekking poke, a clever name that I made for a modified trekking pole the size of a stake, and started banging it on a tree. The eyes didn't move at all and just stared back at me. Fine. I kept moving while I banged the passing by trees with my poke. And then as the trail light turns right, in front of me, I see this line of about a dozen pairs of eyes. All of them just sitting there in the outlines of the trees without moving one bit. This is when the fear started flowing. So I picked up my pace and turned right ignoring any glare in my peripheral vision. I just stormed the heck out of there. Soon I was out of that section, and I managed to make it to a pond where I stealth camp. Whenever I would tell others about this, they would shrug it off, thinking that I'm probably exaggerating or that it was nothing serious. But experiencing it firsthand, all alone, knowing that you're greatly outnumbered was really scary. I wonder if anyone else has had similar experiences that they can't get out of their minds either. Funny thing I just realized is that my trekking poke died slash broke that night while I was using it to climb some rocks, shortly after this episode. It was quite an adventurous hike. The man in the red raincoat. I was hiking in New York and made it to this awesome deli, the Appalachian Market, in time for dinner. I ate a delicious dinner there while I waited out a rainstorm. The deli was so delicious that I decided that I would stealth camp near the road that night. I would get an early start the next morning, fueled by a New York breakfast sandwich and coffee. I crossed the road and found a flat spot to set up near the pond. But I noticed what looked like a homeless person set up nearby with a hammock and a bunch of stuff everywhere. I decided to keep going and found a flat spot a bit further down the trail. A few hours later, I was woken up by a bright light. There was someone outside my tent with a flashing or headlamp and they were shining the light all around. I hear footsteps outside my tent who would shine their light on someone's tent at midnight? That can't be another through hiker can it? 
then I hear a man's voice. Hey, you. Hey, you. Oh, crap. Whatever is outside my tent sounds angry and crazy. What do they want? I hold my breath and hope that they think I'm sleeping. The footsteps stop, and the light shines on and around my tent. Hey, you. What the heck? The angry voice grumbles incoherently. I start wondering if I should yell and try to scare him away. Should I make a run for it? I have no idea if the crazy man outside my tent has a knife or some sort of weapon. So I sit still, and I hope and pray that he will eventually leave. Five or ten minutes later, I hear the footsteps walking away from my tent, and the light disappears. Finally, I can breathe again. The crazy man is gone, but will he return? I fell asleep for a little while, and then suddenly I woke up feeling uneasy. I turn and look out the half-unzipped rainfly of my tent, and notice someone standing outside my tent. Just outside, there is a man with a red raincoat and a gray beard staring at me. He is completely silent, but is staring right at me. I reach to grab my knife, but then I realize I don't have one. I blink and look back for the man, but he's gone. Was that just a dream? The next morning, after very little sleep, I wake up and walk back to the deli. On the side of the trail, I notice a man passed out in a sleeping bag. He's wearing a red raincoat. My wife and I were overnighting on a section that I knew very well. There was a rowdy group at the shelter we had planned on using, and we wanted to get up early. So we ended up using an extremely well-maintained collection of tent sites, not far from the shelter, and were pleased with our spot. We waited until after dark, and no one else showed up like we expected. I was having a rough time sleeping. I'd woken up to the noise of the partiers and was just chilling in the tent while my wife slept. I was getting closer to dozing when a very large buck decided to check out our tent with his antlers. He came right through it. There must have already been a tear or a weak spot. I'm pretty sure that he was as shocked as I was that the tent popped and ripped. And I was scared out of my mind because I'd never encountered a deer doing something like that in all of my years on the trail. I froze. He froze. My wife continued to sleep because she sleeps through smoke alarms, so this frozen deer wasn't waking her. In the dark, it took my brain a second to really grasp what was even happening. Then, because in the middle of the night in the middle of the woods, nose to nose with a wild animal, I was not thinking at my best. I barked. I barked like a dog in his face. He did not move. If he had not been a wild animal, I could have easily given him a good boy pat on the snout. It didn't seem like a good idea at the time, and I just had to wait him out until he slowly removed himself from the interior of the tent and walked quietly off into the night, showing no sign of being spooked. When we ran into the partiers the next day, they told us that he had visited them as well and just stared at them for a while before moving on. My wife woke up the next morning and was genuinely confused about what happened to the tent. I had really thought about messing with her and telling her that she slept through me fighting off a bear or a bobcat or something, but the truth was too irresistible. dad and I were camping next to the Elk River, sharing a tent at the time. We set up camp in a small field next to the river and called it a night. My dad slept with earplugs. I did not. I woke up to something right outside of the tent, right by the flap where our bags were. I heard loud snorting and thought hogs. I woke my dad. He 
sat up to listen, but of course there was no sound. He goes back to sleep and it starts again. I shake him awake again. Again, no sounds. This time he goes back to sleep without his earplugs. Well, the snorting came on the side of the tent and he shot up quick. I stick my head out but saw nothing. No tracks. Our food bag was untouched. It took a long time to get back to sleep, but we learned later that it was likely a deer. My dad swears that he saw Ollie or whatever the little boy was named who supposedly haunts that one shelter. But I forget which one. My friend and I were on Breakneck Pond and Harriman fishing. We were in the middle of the lake in a metal boat. It started pouring, so we went onto the tree line at the end of the lake, so lightning didn't mess us up. These kayakers asked us for immediate help after we got on land. My friend said, that's your problem. But then I said, I'll help real quick. It seemed to be a couple. They were oddly nice, but seemed like they had some good hiking experience and what to do in hazards. So they claimed shelter was a half mile going away from the campgrounds, so we decided to follow. I got a weird feeling as the skinny guy walked behind me, almost like he was going to blindside us with a knife, and his spouse, the woman leading the group. So it then started hailing, then it got really painful. We were getting destroyed by dime-sized hail balls, coming at a 30 mile per hour fall rate. I was really desperate to find shelter. Then I realized that my friend and I were following random strangers in the woods. I knew those campgrounds like the back of my hand. So I finally realized that camp group didn't add cabins at the end of the pond. I got my friend and said, let's go the other way. They tried to get us to come back, but I refused. My gut feeling could have saved us from getting knifed by two strangers. We got back on the boat after the hail stopped, and the strangers were nowhere to be seen. During my through hike, I had planned to get off the trail around Waynesboro, Virginia for a wedding in Shenandoah. I had a friend hike with me for five days out of Damascus, which we did 15 mile days. Then I picked up the pace to make it in time. I needed to average about 23 miles per day for something like 12 days to make it. Started with 29 and 28 mile days and averaged 23 for a four day push to Pierisburg. Then needed to repeat that to Daleville, but I slowed up and got there a day late. It was shortly after that that I found out uh, that the wedding was a day earlier than I had thought, so I was two days behind. I decided to get off at Buena Vista instead, which I had not wanted to do since I had stopped in there during a section hike. So cut to Friday, the day before the wedding. I hiked into Glasgow for lunch and had a small resupply to get me through the night. I packed out half the pizza and began the big uphill in the heat of the day. I chugged all of my water by the top of the mountain where I had decided to camp, so I needed to hike on to the next shelter. I had to signal for what would be the last time, so I decided to book my rental car from Enterprise and request a pickup from the road where the trail comes out. Declined. I pick a time when the store is open, check the hours. They close at noon on Saturdays. Well, crap. I text my girlfriend the situation and begin to hike downhill, losing signal. I make it to Punch Bowl and run down with just my bottle and filter for water. Didn't bring my headlamp and it's getting dark quick. I ran back up the trail and got to my pack, took out my headlamp and kept hiking into the night. I only did maybe three miles and then had to look for a stealth camp spot to camp. 
I finally found a small flat spot barely big enough for my tent, right off the trail by like two feet. I threw up my tent and wasn't even hungry from dehydration. So I went to hang my food, smelly pizza included, from a tree. But I was looking for a suitable limb for like ten minutes with no luck. Eventually I said screw it and threw my food onto a tiny branch about eight feet off the ground, in the tree right across the trail from my tent, maybe ten feet out my front door. I go to sleep and wake up at 4 a.m. to large footsteps behind my tent. Probably not human because it was coming from the woods, not the trail. I shuffled my sleeping pad to scare it off. It just froze for a second, then kept wandering closer. All the deer I had seen were super skittish, and this creature was not, so I assumed that it was a bear. I make as much noise as possible, and it detours a wide berth around my side of the tent. So I play some music from my phone while packing up loudly. Music ends and I hear nothing. I peeked out. Nothing. I pack up my tent while singing loudly, grab my food bag and hike off the trail. Never ended up eating that pizza either. One time, I was on a solo trip and passed through Tennessee slash North Carolina near Smoky Mountain National Park. I found a primitive campsite off the main road to stay at, but was not familiar with the area. I chanced it as it was late, and my options were limited. The road to the site was basically wagon tracks with downed branches in the way, and I remember it being really humid and wet, and dark as it was late. I pull up to what I assume was the site. There was a really old piece of machinery right off the road, but it was pretty old, so not exactly a sign of people being nearby, recently, but kind of weird. It sounds cliche, but I really did get some deliverance vibes, mostly the scenery. I genuinely did feel like I was out of place, and not really welcome, despite having just traveled across the country and staying in remote places all over. The site had a lean-to, and for some reason I cannot recall, I did not set up my tent to stay in. I was going to sleep in the lean-to with just my sleeping bag. As I was setting up my stuff, I noticed this metal stand with hooks but nothing hanging. I had never seen anything like this. Upon expecting the lean-to, I found massive spider webs and dead spider carcasses in the corners and under the roof parts. Everything was set up for a horror story, but I ended up fine throughout the night. No spiders, bugs, hillbillies, or anything like that. My conclusion was that this site was a site for hunters. The metal hooks were for hanging deer. In the morning, the amount of dead spiders and other bugs caught in the webs was even more frightening. I lived in Kingsport, Tennessee in middle school. My family had a half an acre plot that led back into acres of random woods and hills. There were cabins, dirt roads, and even churches back there that were not on any map. Some were abandoned, but many had people living in them full time. My siblings and I would go exploring, and my brother accidentally stumbled on either a moonshine or meth cabin once. He thought that it was abandoned and went to check it out but someone heard his footsteps, and suddenly he heard a bunch of people scattering around inside, and someone telling everyone he'd go check to see what was outside. My brother ran back into the woods and didn't stop running. We stopped going back there after that. Before that incident, we'd find makeshift tents made out of branches that hadn't been there before. Around the tents would be weird extinguished campfires and weird crap hung in the trees like a string full of cans and bottles just hanging around like wind chimes. Even twig wreaths and figures like something straight out of the Blair Witch Project. All the other people in the area knew of this and said nothing. You keep your mouth shut about anything you've seen or heard in the woods. 
because you never know who knows or is someone who does something secret out in the mountains. If you did happen to see something, no. That was just an animal or even a cryptid of some sort. It wasn't a person. I'm from southwestern Virginia, and one day I was driving around a gravel back road just riding around when I came upon a group of 10 plus people in white robes. They were walking down the road towards the creek. I put it in reverse and got out of there pretty quick, but in hindsight, I'm pretty sure it was just people performing a baptism down by the creek. I'll make a shorter story from a longer one involving sensitive auras. But once, I was with a girl on Big Frog Mountain at dusk, miles away from anyone. We decided to walk up a trail when right behind the car, I stepped in a mud puddle with odd-looking light brownish water. I pointed the unusual collar to her when we started walking. Not far up the trail, she started getting scared and we went back to the car. In the car, we started making out while lying in the front seat, and she had her hand draped out the window. I felt an odd sensation in my back. It had happened before when people were behind me, and told her to pull her hand in, which she did. A few minutes later, I felt the sensation in my back again, but it felt more urgent. I rolled her window up, but being a teenager, I continued with the makeout session. A few minutes later, it felt like someone had stuck a live wire to my back. I sat up, started the car, and head back down the mountain. She was obviously confused and asked me what was wrong. I replied that I didn't know, but something was wrong somewhere. We went back to my parents' house and was assured by them that the family was okay. Having calmed down some, we ate a little dinner, then started to leave. After I opened the car door for her, I walked around the back of the car. While walking, I glanced at the back of the car and saw handprints the same color of the mysterious mud puddle on the car. The last one was over the back window, and it was obvious that someone was watching us while inching their way to the front driver's side window. When I saw the handprints, it was like being hit with a lightning bolt and I knew what had happened. Cold chills ran all over me. I got her out of the car, and as soon as she saw the prince, she knew too. This story is the absolute truth, so help me, and I will never forget it. In 2007, I was a designated driver, stone cold sober for my boyfriend and friends. He and I went back to his parents' house in southern West Virginia. His parents were out of town, and he was drunk, so I got him put to bed and went out to back to have a smoke. Typical house up a holler setting at the bottom of the mountain, with about a half an acre fenced in, running up the hillside. I didn't turn a light on and it was typical Appalachia dark. Sat down on the porch swing, lit up, and all of the sudden hear what sounds like a woman being absolutely bloody murdered about a hundred feet away from me. I threw my cigarette and got in the house quick, turned on the porch light slash floodlight, and saw what can only be described as a huge black panther running back and forth inside the fence, absolutely screaming and screeching its head off, because I guess it thought it was trapped in the fence once it jumped in. I watched it until I figured it out and jumped back over the fence and ran up the mountain. I think only one person has ever truly believed me. When 
when my mother was just a girl in the 1940s, she was spending the night at her aunt and uncle's house in southern West Virginia. The house was in a holler, and her grandmother's house was at the end of that holler, a big field separating the two, with a big sycamore tree right in the middle of the field. Her aunt sent her to her grandmother's house to either get a cup of sugar or flour. She said she didn't hurry back and just played until almost dark. She started back down the path to her house, which went by the sycamore tree. She said that she got right under the tree when something in the tree let out a yell that sounded like a woman screaming. She threw the cup away, ran towards the house, and met her uncle coming out with his rifle to shoot what was most likely a mountain lion. He didn't find the mountain lion, and they never found the cup that she threw away. I grew up in Big Canoe, Georgia. My sister and I had to ride our bikes a couple of miles mostly downhill to the Jeep trail to get to the swim club each day in the summer. Over the years, we had many bear encounters. Black bears are shy but quite intimidating when the only thing between you and them is a huffy bike. One particular day, as we walked our bikes up one of the few hills that we had to cross, we were very aware of how slow and quiet footsteps in the woods. To this day, I am convinced that it was a mountain lion or a cougar following us. We never saw it, but some of the sounds that it made sent chills down our spines. The forest got so quiet at one point, even the birds went silent. We made it to the top of the hill and pedaled as hard as we could to the safety of the clubhouse. We were so freaked out about it that we skipped the pool for the rest of the week that summer. My name's Octo. I'm from Michigan, but I love Appalachia. The mountains are in my blood. Not to mention, it's the most beautiful place on Earth. My grandfather and many generations of my family before him was from Boone County, West Virginia. Anyway, the preamble is mostly irrelevant, but that's the reason I'm in this subreddit. Anyway, this story doesn't entirely take place in Appalachia, but could have easily ended there. A few years ago, one of my friend's parents paid me to pick their daughter up from New York City and bring her back to Detroit because she's somewhat disabled and she had missed a few greyhounds that they had booked for her. The drive to New York City was relatively uneventful, got pulled over for having an out headlight, slept in my car at a rest stop, and woke up in western Pennsylvania to a misty mountain sunrise. I get to New York. The traffic sucked and there was nowhere to park, but eventually I found my friend. She loaded her stuff into my trusty HHR, and we were off. Pretty much everything was going all right, until we decided we should stop and rest. Again, in the mountains of western Pennsylvania. Initially, we chose a Walmart parking lot so we could get food, have access to a bathroom, and so that if something did happen to us, there would be cameras. But there were a few shady cars that seemed to take interest in us so we decided to push west and sleep at a rest stop instead. We tried that. When we got there, we had some snacks and just BS till dark, so we could easily and safely go to sleep. But then I noticed something. There was a car sitting in the parking lot of the rest stop that looked eerily similar to one of those shady cars we had seen earlier. A newer Jeep, SUV, white. I debated for a few minutes whether we should worry about it, since there were probably tons of people who drive those before deciding to keep pushing west. Exhausted, barely able to drive, potentially paranoid but motivated to find somewhere safe to sleep. Eventually we found another Walmart, and parked somewhere distant from the door, but not so distant that we were invisible. We talked and eventually were almost asleep. 
until another white Jeep compass pulled up right next to us. I saw his eyes, and I'll never forget them. They were cold but hateful. Barely awake, I slammed the transmission from park to drive and floored it, heading straight for the highway. We flew through the mountains, but couldn't lose the brand new Jeep on the highway. Eventually, we decided to get off and try to lose them by zigzagging and changing roads, heading southwest instead of due west, as he probably presumed we were doing. After daybreak, we found ourselves in a small town with a busy Wendy's or McDonald's or something, where we finally got some sleep. That night, I was either paranoid, which is entirely feasible, or we were followed for well over a hundred miles. Either way, it was the most terrifying thing to happen to me in the mountains so far. I was living in a moderately remote, about a mile out of town up an isolated road, area of West North Carolina, Andrews, North Carolina specifically, back in about 2002. My brother and I, at the time, thought each other were sleeping and only consolidated our experiences the next day. We're sharing a room in a wood cabin nestled only about 10 feet from the mountainside. In the dark early morning, we heard some pretty unearthly sounds that the next day we compared to all local animal sounds and none of them were even close. They honestly sounded closer to Jurassic Park fake mechanical or modified whale or dolphin sounds than anything biological that I've ever heard before or since. And we heard heavy walking on our roof that then dropped onto the front of the porch, then back to the roof before going away. The next day, we saw footprints in the snow that were, as best as I can explain, most like kangaroo footprints. Way too big to be rabbits. But there aren't any kangaroos in North Carolina. We followed the tracks, and they dead-ended in the middle of our yard. At least six feet from the tree line. With snow scuffed behind them. Like the kind of stuff you see when someone jumps from a point. But again, there was nowhere nearby to jump to within any reasonable distance to any bipedal animal or even a human. It was just like it took off directly up. I'm not a believer in the supernatural. I regularly dismiss most things happily. I don't even believe in religion, etc. But this is one thing that I just can't, despite my best efforts, explain. And I've tried, repeatedly since it happened. But I've got nothing. I'm stumped. The most likely thing on the surface would have been a cougar. But it doesn't make sense for that. I've heard a ton of cougar sounds. Seen cougar prints, etc. They don't match up. None do. It wasn't a cougar. It wasn't even close. I still to this day, 10 years later, have no idea what it was. And to this day, I'm honestly still a tiny bit freaked out to stay at my mom's house. Though thankfully, I've never run across anything like that since. I went camping by myself one night to clear my head, because I had a lot going on at the time. Summer was almost over, so I was trying to enjoy it while I can. I wasn't able to sleep because I felt like someone or something was around. I have one picture from that night, I'll have to see if I can find it, but all you saw is two red dots about three foot off the ground. After that, I refused to leave my hammock. At about 3 a.m., I started to hear something moving around. I know how animals sound walking. I'm pretty big into nature. But whatever this creature was, it was up on two feet walking about six foot away from me. As I was curled up in my hammock, not even attempting to look out, I finally managed to go to sleep.
Some friends and I were boarding college one night, and I was borrowing my dad's car for the week. So we decided to drive over Fonday Mountain in southeastern Kentucky because none of us had been down that road before. It was about 3 a.m. when we finally got to the top and started coming down the other side. At first, we saw what looked like a large cat about the size of a mountain lion, but it was running through the woods on two feet. We drove as fast as we could to get to the next town, which was Clarefield, Tennessee. When you get into the town, there's a street light on either side of the street at city limit sign. The lights looked like they were floating back and forth across the road switching places. As we drove through the town, we saw two men putting what looked like a body bag into the back of a van. At this point, I floored it and found the first open gas station so I could find to get directions back. I still have no idea what we saw or why. We were stone sober, and while it was late, we frequently stayed up that late, so I doubt that it was sleep deprivation. This didn't happen to me, but happened to my mom in the late 60s. My mother grew up in New Hampshire, but was born in Virginia. One year when she was about four, she was getting dressed in her snow clothes to go outside. She had a younger brother at this point and he was three. My grandmother, her mom, would dress her and then go and dress her brother. And by the time she got back, my mom would have taken off all of her snow clothes. So to fix this, she dressed my mom and stuck her outside with the dog right after. My mom just wandered off into the forest. They lived pretty much in the middle of nowhere at this point. The dog went with her, and then she was missing for two days. The dog returned home. They thought she was dead. And then they found her a couple of miles away, sitting at the bottom of a hill, covered in dirt and just playing in the snow. She doesn't remember what happened, but I guess she was just missing and then found. Even though there were tons of search efforts, the two days she was missing, and like dogs and everything, and she was also missing a lot of her snow clothes which were never found, it always gives me chills whenever she or my grandmother talk about it. I've been a lifelong outdoorsman living in West Virginia and Virginia, and I've had a lot of scary run-ins from being in between a mother black bear and her cubs to being face to face with a mountain lion, as well as being stalked by one. But one of the scariest things was one day in an area that is called the Devil's Ditch slash Haunted Branch. All of the older people say if you're going to be in it at night to have a gun or just don't go. It's extremely remote, and no one lives up there. It's all a hunting reserve. Well, one day at about noon, I was up there with my father, showing him some of the side trails and fire roads, when we stopped at the last gate. It's the farthest you can go into it by vehicle. We were going to stop and take a break. I needed to pee, and he was looking at the maps. Well, I'm standing on a rock looking into the woods, and there was a lot of undergrowth with large poplars growing up through it. You'd be lucky to see five to ten feet into the woods at eye level. I start peeing when all of a sudden, poplar trees start shaking about ten to fifteen feet in front of me. I'm looking up at about twenty feet in the air at the trees, and they are moving back and forth violently. While this is occurring, we heard what sounded like monkeys and almost like samurai talk. These tulip poplars were about one to two feet in diameter, 20 feet up in the tree, so at the base they were probably around three to three and a half feet in diameter. Nothing should be able to move a tree like that that freely. I finish peeing rapidly and walk backwards as my dad is yelling holding his pistol. I get in the jeep, throw it in reverse and head back down the fire road, which was pretty rough at this time. 
For about a half a mile down this fire road, we can hear whatever it is yelling and making its noise at us in the footsteps. I've got chills just describing it. And the fact that it kept up with my Jeep down the mountain through the woods, and I could see the underbrush parting, and at one time thought I saw a brown fur, but looking over my shoulder, but trying not to tear up the Jeep was a bit hard. I fish in this area. Target shoot up there with buddies and hunt. And we've heard things that sound like monkeys as it gets closer to dark. Rocks have fallen off the mountainside in places where there are no rock outcroppings. Had a friend's truck get rocked in the middle of the night. And yes, there are a lot of bears, but most of the time a bear will only mess with the vehicle if there's food in it. I'm by no means a Bigfoot believer, but I'm also not a denier. I think that we are naive to think that something like that doesn't exist. I'm just sharing what I've experienced. And I just remembered something as I was reading back through this. When we pulled up and got out of the Jeep, the smell was almost like a bear, but with an almost human B.O. smell with it. I've smelled a lot of animals, and that smell was very unique and has stuck with me. As well as when we pulled up, it was extremely quiet and you got the feeling that you were being watched, which happens often in places like this, and I've grown accustomed to it, but this day was obviously different. I should also add that it was June or July when this happened, so the underbrush was like a jungle. Growing up in Cookville, Tennessee, we had Crazy George's Bridge and Booger Swamp. Crazy George's Bridge goes over a railroad track where a railroad worker was supposedly decapitated by a train. He wanders the tracks with a lantern, looking for his head. And if you stop your car on the bridge at night, it won't start back up again. In the 80s, it was also rumored that Satanists used the bridge for rituals, and for decades, teenagers have tested the theories with late-night visits. Booger Swamp was a wooded area where a witch supposedly lived, and if your animals went missing, it was said that she had called them to her lair to use for spells and potions. There's also a witch's cemetery with strange pyramid-shaped tombs. As a young newspaper reporter, I went on a few pot field raids with the Kentucky State Police. We once went to a pot field that was hidden in a narrow valley. The troopers noticed a wire rigged over the valley, running from one side to the other. Turns out it was a trip wire, rigged to a fire cannon that was embedded in the ground, dead center of the field pointed straight up. It was made from large diameter steel pipe and loaded with several pounds of black powder as propellant. The cops estimated that it was packed with about 50 pounds of scrap metal, including chains, bolts, nails, old brake pads, and all manners of stuff. Long story short, it was clearly designed to shoot down any snooping aircraft that swooped in just a little bit too low. One trooper told me that a Kentucky Army National Guard, Black Hawk, had been scheduled to recon the valley that morning, but they canceled due to another mission. This tale was told to us by our grandfather. It was winter in the lumbering camp. Remember when chestnuts were timbered? It was late one night, and a knock came at their cabin door. Opening the cabin door, they found an old woman who pointed at one of the men and said, you are needed at home, and then vanished. No footprints in the snow. No signs of the woman. The man she told to go home did. His mother had died. No one ever knew the identity of the witch woman.
Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Get a good night's sleep, everyone. And I'll read to you in the next video. Bye-bye now.